Hello, my name is Becky LaRoche. Um, I'm one of the high school counselors here at West Boylston, um, and I work with students in 10th grade as well as in 12th grade. Um, here is a presentation geared towards seniors and parents of seniors to talk specifically about the college planning process. Um, this presentation took place on September 23rd at 645, and I am doing a recording of it to send out to families who might want to hear or see some of the information again, or maybe we're not able to make the presentation. So I'm going to go through the slides. Um, certainly at the end, if there are questions you still have, please reach out and contact me through email or give me a call and I will be happy to help you. So we'll get started. The first thing I want to mention is I have met with almost every senior this week to talk a little bit about the college planning process, but also to spend time talking at a broader level about making plans after high school and the different uh, paths students might take and what some of our seniors in the past have done in terms of planning for after high school. Um, tonight will be very specific to the college application process as that can be a pretty time intensive process that requires the students to get a lot of documents together and ready for the applications and requires me to do the same. So all but about 10 seniors um, saw my presentation this week once or maybe even twice <laughs> about, you know, different paths after high school and how to get started in researching or where to go once they've kind of narrowed down some choices. I definitely spent some time on the college planning process, but tonight's presentation will go into that even more in depth. For the students that I didn't see this week, I will be meeting with them next Thursday at 12.30. So first, um, students receive, um, during the presentation Thursday evening, students received a blue folder. If students were not at that meeting, Friday morning, I gave out the remainder of the blue folders to seniors. And I just wanna go what over what's in the content of those folders. First and foremost is the student's current transcript. Um, which is actually the initial transcript that does get sent to colleges if students are applying early action or early decision um, or any time before the end of the first semester. Students applying to schools after the first semester, their transcript will also include first semester. But students who are applying early, we send your mid-year transcripts out as well. Um, so colleges can keep up with how you're doing senior year. On the transcript is a student's GPA, their grade point average, as well as their class rank, and you can find that on the bottom. Also in the folder is a college representative meeting permission form, college visitation form, which is yellow, the counselor recommendation form, which is green, teacher recommendation form, which is blue, and the parent brag sheet, which is white. I will actually spend time talking about each of these forms and what they mean as we go through the presentation. So on the transcript, we do have your GPA, which is based on a 4.0 scale. It is weighted. So the GPA that you're looking at on your transcript is a weighted GPA. Um, certainly if you have questions or concerns about it, you can see me or contact me. But the way um, GPAs are weighted is if a student is taking an honors class, one point is, honor, is added for that honors course. And if it's an AP class, two points are added. So for example, if a student received an A in a CP class, that would be a 4.0. If it was an honors class, it would be calculated in as a 5.0. And if it were an AP class advanced placement, it would be calculated in as a 6.0. Um, so this does mean that some students will have a GPA that's above a 4.0, even though we are on a 4.0 scale. Um, just keep in mind that every college will recalculate your GPA and each college uses a different formula. Some colleges might match the formula we use. Some colleges might just give half a point for honors classes and a full point for AP. So that's a good question to ask as you're starting to talk to college admissions counselors. Also, some colleges will take all of your classes into account and some colleges will look only at your core classes, your English, your math, your science, your social studies and your foreign language. There are test scores to think about when applying to college and this includes both the SAT and the ACT I know quite a few students did take the SAT in September and are signing up for the November date. Um, but it's important to know that if you are submitting an SAT or an ACT score, you need to have those scores submitted to the college you're applying to directly from the college board. Colleges will not accept the scores from us. 
they want the official reports and those come from the College Board directly. You, most students probably have a College Board account from when they took the PSATs as a junior, um, but if not, they should create one or if they can't remember their password, they'll have to have it reset. That is not information I have, that's only information that the student has. I would recommend when creating that account, you use your personal email so that you can receive all correspondence. Some of emails from the College Board might not make it into your inbox for your school email because of filters. Upcoming test dates um, for the SAT, November 6th, you do need to register by October 8th. So I did just send out a reminder um, to students to get on that and make sure that they sign up. And then there's a December 4th test date, so you want to sign up by November, uh, December 4th, you want to sign up by November 4th. We do not offer the SAT here at our school, but neighboring schools do offer the SAT. So when you're registering for the SAT, um, it will try to give you a test site, site nearby. I just helped a student register for his SAT the other day and it put him at Wachusett right in Holden, so definitely close by. We also have the ACT, the American College Test, which is not necessarily as popular as the SAT, um, but it's another form of a test. Some students might find that they do better on that type of test versus the SAT. It's really about personal preference, um, but most students will just go ahead with their SAT scores. But here are some upcoming test dates for the ACT and sites that it often offer testing for that particular exam. So I do want to talk a little bit about standardized testing during COVID because I made some pretty big changes happened last year when we were really in the midst of the pandemic. Um, certainly all of these types of presentations were virtual. We were working remotely from home, having school remote from home. So things were different than they are now. But I did want to just mention that you want to be aware of the language used about testing for the colleges that you're applying to. So some schools decided during COVID to pilot test optional. So they're trying it out for two to three years, and then they're going to decide whether or not they continue with that. So if you're at a school piloting test optional, then that likely means you're a test optional school and you can choose whether or not to send your test scores. But you just want to double check and make sure that that's overall for the whole university or perhaps it's just for um, or it's for all the schools, but they're still going to require a test for the School of Nursing. You know, that's an important question to check. What it means if a school is test optional is that the SAT scores and ACTs are not required, that you can apply without those scores, and that counselors will look more heavily at your transcript, letters of recommendation, your essay, and your activities resume. There's also schools that will call themselves test flexible, where you can submit any type of test at, at any combination. So maybe you took an SAT and an ACT, um, and you liked your math score on the SAT, but then you're, you had a score on the ACT that was higher, maybe those are the only test scores you send and you don't send you know, the English portion of your SAT. So you can decide. You can also send scores from AP exams if you want to. It's important that families are test aware. Test optional does not always mean test blind. Some test optional schools will still use test scores for merit-based scholarships or might make the assumption that you have low test scores because you're not submitting them. So you always wanna double check those admissions requirements and definitely check that out um, with admissions counselors, the schools you're really interested in. When you're selecting colleges to apply to, you wanna keep in mind three categories. And I just talked to students about this this week. Applying to five to seven schools is probably a good number to aim for because three to four of those schools will be realistic schools that you apply to. And when I say realistic, it means that your GPA is right within the average range of the students that tend to be accepted to that college or university. Um, a REACH school is where your GPA falls a little bit below or at the lower end of the average of what's commonly accepted at that school. And then a safety school is your GPA is probably at the high end or even higher than the average range of students that they typically accept at that school. So when you're looking at colleges, you'll be able to see in their admissions tab of the website what the average GPA is of students who are accepted for this current school year. So students who were seniors last year and that are now at college, when they were applying, the average GPA will have a range. It also will tell you the college acceptance rate, which is another good thing to look at. Um, you know, the lower the number of the acceptance rate, the more competitive that particular school is, because 
but there's a, you know, a lot of students applying to a smaller school, it's going to be more competitive than a lot of students applying to a larger campus. So that's something that we really have to keep in mind. And sometimes something new for students to be aware of is that in West Boylston, you're one of 85 seniors, but out when you're applying to colleges, you're one of thousands of students applying to the different colleges and universities. So it's definitely something to keep in mind as you narrow down your schools. I think it's really important to get out and visit campuses, talk to admissions counselors, really get a feel for the college, ask questions specific to you. You know, maybe you want to talk to your REACH school and talk about your GPA and what else you, you know, you have in your application um, for them to review to really get a sense of is this school maybe more realistic than you thought or more of a REACH than you thought. So you are allowed three excuse days to tour colleges from, um, to, to tour colleges. You just need to complete um, the college visit form, which is one of the forms in your folder. And then that needs to be signed by a parent and submitted to me prior to your visit. So, you know, when you're going to tour a school that takes planning, so it's not like you would say, oh, today I'm going to go to a college. You're probably planning weeks in advance of when you can take time with your family to go visit a school or more than one school in one visit. So as soon as you make that plan, fill out this form, bring it to me to be signed. We hold on to it. You're marked absent that day. But when you go on your tour at that college or university, you want to ask admissions representative to give you something on letterhead that states you're visiting that day to validate that visit. Some schools will also just send an email to you that you can forward to me or they'll want my direct email so they can send that. Colleges are used to doing that, so it's something to ask for. Once we receive that, we will mark your absence excuse. While you're there, if you're able to have a college interview or schedule one virtually, highly recommend it, especially for the schools that become those five to seven schools on your final application list. Um, it's a great way for the college to get to know you. It shows that you're interested in, and you can ask questions really specific for you. One thing I've been telling students all week, show interest. It makes a difference. Prior to being a school counselor here in West Boylston, I was an admissions counselor at Northeastern University. And every time, you know, a student made contact with us, we'd mark it down. So if a student, you know, I was that person on the front line. So I was at open houses, I was going to high schools, I was talking to students, I was conducting interviews and information sessions. So every time I had one of those activities, I'd ask students to complete a contact form that I would collect. So if you visit a school at an open house, fill out one of the forms. If you see that same school come here to West Boylston to visit students, fill out the form again. Um, when you go to visit the college for an interview, fill out the form again. Already, that's three contacts that will be marked in your file. Even if the school says they don't keep track of that, it still can make a difference because you're making that human in-person connection. So when I was a counselor, if I met a student who, um, you know, I got to interview one-on-one -on -one and they had done this amazing project in high school and were really impressive and seemed like they really things together and would be a great leader on campus, but maybe their GPA wasn't quite, you know, as competitive as we might like, I might fight for that student because I saw all these great qualities when I met with them and I got to hear about all these great things they did. And I can see they're interested because there's three contacts marked in their file. So that's really important. You also, in addition to having three excuse absences, we are, um, we host colleges to come here to West Boylston and hold small meetings with up to 10 students about their college or university. So the upcoming list you can see on the bottom um, are colleges that are coming up starting next week. Every Friday, the list on Naviance, and that's, I showed students where to find that this week. On Naviance, there's a list of the schools that are coming here, and every Friday that list gets updated. But Tuesdays and Thursdays are the days that representatives come to West Boylston. And you can go on to Naviance as a student and register to attend one of these events. You must register on Naviance. That way, the admissions counselor knows who, they're, who they are meeting when they come to visit. In addition, you do have to complete the permission form because you need to get permission from the teacher's class who you're missing to make sure that you have a plan to make up any of that work. But that's great. That's a really intimate way to meet a counselor, talk about a college. And generally, the, co the counselor who comes here is the counselor who reads applications for our region and for West Boylston. So they can put a face with the application that they'll be having in front of them. So one, this will be new to some of our seniors. I didn't talk about this this week, but there are different ways to apply to schools. And you want to be really mindful of how you choose to apply to the school. 
early decision is basically like a contract. That is a binding decision. So a student who is accepted as early decision has to attend that college and take their applications out of all other colleges. That is not a typical way that students apply unless they really, really know they want to go there. They've known forever. They've talked to their family. They've gone there and they're super committed. Um, generally, students at West Boylston like to apply early action, which is a non-binding agreement. But what it does do is you receive an earlier response to your application, but you still have until May 1st to commit to the school or decide whether or not that's the school you're going to go to. With early decision, that's not the case. Um, if you're accepted, they assume you're going and you basically have signed a form saying, yes, I'm going to attend if I'm accepted. Certainly, if the financial package is really not a good fit um, for your family, they might allow um, some grace on that, but overall, it's a binding agreement. So a good percentage of the students will actually end up applying early action. Those deadlines tend to be anywhere between October 15th and December 1st. Um, so a lot, some of our students really like to do early action and have all their applications out prior to the holiday break. It's definitely a great option for students. However, uh, however, if you're a student who maybe has had a year where your grades dropped a bit, you're trying to strengthen your transcript, you're trying to work hard to bring your GPA up a few points, you might want to wait and apply regular decision when you've had an opportunity to get grades from the first semester of senior year. In regular decision, those deadlines tend to be anywhere between January 15th and March 15th or even April 1st. Um, but that's really just a normal process for students to apply. With early action, there's the advantage that there might be more merit scholarships available. Um, again, you get that decision earlier, so that feels good to get that out of the way, and your applications are done. Even if you decide to apply regular decision, and in your mind you're thinking at that time, those due dates are after the holiday break, I still strongly encourage those students to be doing all that work now. Just still try to get your applications done if possible, before that holiday break, because it can be stressful. So when you wait till last minute, that just adds more stress to yourself, it adds more stress to your family, to people that you've asked recommendations for. So you can still start submitting materials early or at least prepping them. Um, you don't have to wait till closer to the deadline to do that. Rolling admission, um, that really just offers a really large window for students. Colleges just respond to applicants as the applications come in. So there's no set deadline. You don't have to wait till a certain date to hear back. They're just constantly reviewing and getting decisions out. And then there's open admission. Um, and this is a type of unselective and non-competitive college admissions process in which you just have to show that you ha have a high school diploma in order to start attending classes at that college or become a student there. So that would be for like um, community college, like Mount Wachusett Community College or Consigamont. It's important to have letters of recommendation, and it's required by most college applications. We recommend that students get go ahead right away, early in the fall, and get two teacher recommendations. You can start this next week, even if you haven't narrowed down your list of where you want to apply. A lot of colleges will just ask for one, but you can always send additional ones, but some will want two. So it's important to go ahead and get two teacher recommendations. This can be from any two high school teachers. Um, even if it's not a teacher that you have this year. So think about someone you have a good relationship with, or you really enjoyed their class, or maybe their, what they teach is related to what you're going to major in. Make sure you ask the teacher really in person right now because we're attending school in person. Once the teacher says, yes, I'll write you a recommendation, you want to complete this teacher recommendation form for that teacher. That just helps them make your recommendation really personable. Maybe there's something you're hoping the teacher will reference in their recommendation, and you can write that on this form. You also need to go on to Naviance, and I showed students how to do this this week, and request the teacher recommendation through Naviance. So Naviance is the way that all student documentation or documents are sent to colleges and universities. That's how I send the whole package, which includes your school profile, your transcript, your two teacher recommendations, my recommendation, and any other recommendation a student may have gotten. It has to go through Naviance from my account. Um, that way colleges know it's official, and that has not been tampered with in any way by a student. So it's really important that students request the teacher recommendations through Naviance because all of your teachers have Naviance accounts, so they just upload the recommendation and it's in your file. So when I go to submit documents, it's right there and we can see it. Give your teachers ample time. They are busy. <laughs> so if you, I mean, I would start thinking now who you want to ask and go ahead and ask them. 
even if your deadline is not until December 1st or April 1st, that's okay. I would go ahead and get that done. Um, there's nothing worse than the student saying, can you write me a recommendation like for tomorrow? Because my deadline's for tomorrow. That just, it's not gonna go well. That teacher might not be able to stay after school that day. They might have to might have a meeting with another family. You need to give teachers a chance to find the time to do that. And that they wanna do it for you. All of our teachers are happy to write letters of recommendation and wanna see you succeed and wanna be part of your post high school planning, but you need to give them time. Um, all schools will require a counselor recommendation given by me. So I will ask you to complete both the counselor recommendation form and the parent brag sheet is optional, but helps me get more information. Um, I really love the senior class. This is a senior class I'm an advisor for. This is the senior class where I have most students when I, from when I was a middle school counselor. So I do feel like I know the students really well, um, but I try my best to make my rec letter of recommendation really personalized. And it helps me if I have these two informational sheets handed out, um, because if there was an extenuating circumstance during high school that you want me to touch upon, um, when talking to a counselor, if you have that on the sheet, then I know to do that. Maybe there's something I don't know you're involved in outside of school, but it should definitely be included. So it's super helpful. The more information you give me, the more personalized your counselor recommendation will be. And that goes a long way because some schools counselors have caseloads of like 500 students. So they might not be able to write personalized recommendations for each and every student. With 85, I can do that. Um, but it helps me to have information from you. And I also need ample time um, because I'm working with so many students. You can also always include an outside letter of recommendation that's optional. So if you've had a coach for a few years that you've worked closely with, or a supervisor at a job, um, or an extracurricular activity advisor, they can certainly write you a letter of recommendation. They will not have a Naviance account if they're not a teacher here at the school. So those letters of recommendation need to be emailed to me and I will add them to your Naviance account to send out with your other letters of recommendation. So there's different ways to complete applications. Most applications will be found on the Common App. Most colleges and universities use the Common App. So I talked to your students this week about uh, creating a Common App account if they haven't already. Um, that's really important. So from this point on, when the call, when you, students have actually narrowed down what colleges they're applying to, students are really going to use the Common App the most because that's how they submit their documents and their information and their essay. But I submit everything from Naviance using a program called eDocs. So these two platforms need to talk. So the way to do that is students must match their Common App account to the Naviance account. And I talk to students about how to do that and I provide them with a YouTube video, um, which is also right here. And this PowerPoint will be sent out to all folks as well. But that's super important. If they're not matched and not talking to each other, I'll have no way of knowing where students are applying and where I need to send their documents. So that's key, um, really, really needs to happen. There's another platform coalition app. Um, some students, some schools might use that um, network for applications in my three years Working with seniors, I haven't had anybody on the Coalition app. Um, most students will be using the Common app. Every now and then, we'll get a school that um, doesn't really require paper anymore, but that you have to actually apply online through their website. That was Worcester State for the longest time, but they just joined the Common application over the summer. So that's good news for our students. But um, those you know, Coalition apps and individual school applications, you can't match those to Naviance, but I can still submit your documents to Naviance. So you still need to just tell me if you're applying to a school that does not use the Common App. If you apply to a school that uses the Common App, I should be able to see it on Naviance. I talked to students at length this week about using the Naviance account and showed them some different tools they can use to reach search colleges um, and to kind of you know use some filters to narrow down what they're looking for and see what comes up. I did talk to students about once they have gotten their list of their five to seven schools they're applying to, that they put it under colleges I'm applying to. Once they do that, they can request their transcripts to Naviance and their rec teacher recommendations, and they need to do it that way. They need to press that button because that's the only way I'm notified to send out documents for a student. If students do not go in and actually press the button to do a transcript request or to do a letter of recommendation, that would mean that every day I have to go through each of the 85 students to see if colleges have been added. So it's really important that students are using Naviance to communicate with me because once they request a transcript, 
I get a notification, then I pull their file up, I see where they're applying, I make sure they have all the documents they need, including teacher recommendations, and I go ahead and send it. And what's great when I send it through Navance, there's a timestamp so we know the date that those materials were sent, which is really key. There was one instance last year where a college was telling one of our students that they were not going to review her application, she couldn't get in because her transcript came in late after the deadline. So when I received that email from the parent, you can imagine my stomach drops because I take it really seriously and work hard to meet all deadlines. I was able to go on to Naviance and see that, that that wasn't the case. I had sent the documents actually ahead of the deadline. So I could take a picture of that and I sent a screenshot to the admissions office and I called them and it was simply human error on their end. They took responsibility and the student's application was reviewed and they got accepted. So that was good news and a sigh of relief for me, um, but it's great that we can actually see those dates on Naviance. I also always tell students don't panic once they hit the send button on their Common App to send their application. I might send their documents the same day to the university, but out in cyber world, it could take three to five days for those components to match up and get together <laughs> at that college university, which is okay. So it's not uncommon for a student to receive a text message or an email that they receive the student's application but did not get supporting documents like the transcripts and letters of recommendation, even though I've sent them. So when students receive those, I tell them not to panic, but to always forward me those texts and emails so that we can double check and I can show the student on Maviance that they were sent or we can call the school and just double check if they have those materials. I do want to talk a little bit about the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, also something I talked to the seniors about this week. Um, parents and students have rights to access all educational records. When you waive your rights for this for college admissions purposes only, you are reassuring colleges that recommendations are truthful and candidate and candid and that you did not doctor them in any way. Sometimes um, if you do not do that waiver, then number one, someone might not choose to write your recommendation because they don't want their name to look bad that you know the student still might have accessed the recommendation that was supposed to sent, be sent directly from them. Um, and sometimes the colleges won't even review those recommendations or use them in the application process because they really want to ensure um, integrity and honesty and that those documents coming from the school are coming straight from a third party, which would be me. So this is important. Um, I've talked to students about waiving their rights. Students would waive their FERPA rights on the Common App. You actually cannot match your Common App to Naviance unless you waive these rights. So it's really important that students do that piece. Colleges um, will ask for a list of activities on the Common App, they ask for a list of activities. Um, so that's important that you create a resume to include with your application to, or have it on paper so you're ready to easily type it into your Common App. Um, three things to remember, you want to organize everything so it makes sense under the headers like extracurricular activities, sports, volunteer work, work experience. You want to pay attention to any honors, leadership positions you've held to include those. And you always want to mark how many years you've been involved with each of these activities. I'm going to talk a little bit about financial aid. And before I get into it, I'll put a plug in for a virtual financial aid night that we are having on October 14th at 6 p.m., which will be through Zoom, and a link will be sent out for that. Um, I do let students know that I am not an expert on financial aid. That's a very specific thing to each family. I have some general information that I'll share tonight, but I really, really encourage you to attend this presentation um, because it will be given by a financial aid officer from Assumption College, and they will be an expert. They are an expert. So that is key. There are a couple websites that can help you compare costs of different schools across the board. It is important to do your research. Um, funny as it may sound, sometimes a private school might cost less than a public school. This is especially if you're a Massachusetts resident and you're applying to an out-of-state school like the University of Rhode Island. That's a public school, but it might cost you more than another private school because you're out-of-state. Out-of-state tuition tends to be more expensive than in-state tuition. So just something to keep in mind. Um, again, you'll have access to all the links that I'm showing here today, but you could actually compare costs across colleges based on, you know, it's, it's rough. You're going to put in what your income is and how much you're contributing, and it will give you a sense of how much you'll be paying for that college. It's a rough estimate. There's different ways that students can get money to help fund and pay their college education. One is through scholarships. These, this is money that's awarded to a student that does not have to be paid back. It's earned. It's an award. 
um, we in January give all seniors a packet of local scholarships that they can apply for. Um, and those are just available to our West Boylston students. But in addition to that, in Naviance under scholarships, we list a ton of scholarships that students can apply to in addition to the local ones, um, national ones, international ones, based on everything. So it's important to look at that. There are scholarships out there for everybody. You can find a scholarship for being left-handed. You can find a scholarship for being tall. You just have to do the research, just kind of Google scholarships. And as I get scholarships that come my way, I make sure that I advertise those to students as well. So that's something you can start looking at now. You know, you can make a goal and apply to one scholarship a week. Some scholarships will be really easy applications. Some will include um, some type of essay that maybe you can use the same essay for every scholarship application. You'll also receive money from the government. Some will be in the form of federal grants, which again are awarded to students based on need and they do not have to be paid back. Loans. Um, can also be part of a financial aid package, but those are things that have to be paid off. Work study might be granted to a student, which pretty much guarantees them an on-campus job, and then they receive a paycheck um, every week or every other week, so they have that money to help lower some of the college costs, like for books or food and things like that. And then there's merit aid, and these are non-need-based grants. They're awarded on things like academics or athletics or special interest merits, something in the arts, perhaps. Um, and that's another way to fund colleges. It's really important, um, or it's really have to, not just really important, that you complete the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. I'm sure this will be talked about in the financial aid presentation, uh, but the website's here to access it, and this is available starting October 1st. I would not waste time. Come October 1st, I'd make time to get in, log on, create a profile, because filling out the FAFSA can be very intense, it can be frustrating, it can be complicated. There's a lot of documents that are required to complete it. So the earlier you start, the better. The earlier it's so the, the earlier your FAFSA is submitted, the more money you might receive. So submitting it in October or November is gonna benefit you over if you submitted it in March where some, a lot of the money's already been awarded out to students, out to other applicants. There's also a CSS profile that some schools will uh, require, especially private schools. You do have to pay for this particular um, financial aid form, but this is more for merit scholarships or money that the college has to be able to give out to students. So the FAFSA is money coming from the government. And it's free to apply. So if you get to a website for the FAFSA and they're asking for money, it's not the right website. CSS profile, there is a fee for that. Whose responsibility is it? This is something I talked at length about with your students this week as well. So it's important for students to do their research, to submit their application with the fee, to submit the test scores, the essay, the resume, and any additional information that might be needed. If you're applying to an art school, you might have to submit a portfolio. If you're applying for a performing art, you might have to do an audition. Um, it's also on the student to ask for the recommendations from the teacher and to fill out the teacher recommendation forms and counselor recommendation forms. On my end, it's my job to provide information. So I've been telling students all week, check your email. Um, I know they get a lot of email, but we have a Google Classroom set up just for seniors, just for the class of 2022, and I'm constantly posting announcements to it, and they get an email notification every time I do that. So it's a great way to access information and for me to get it out to students. We also have an Instagram page for guidance, which I've encouraged parents and students to follow, and little reminders will be given out through that, or if an open house comes up and they advertise it through Instagram as well. Um, so it's important to be checking those outlets. I'm almost always available during lunch. I actually sit in the cafeteria. Um, and once I get Wi-Fi on my laptop, I'll bring that in with me. So if students just have a quick question about documents or Naviance or a common app, I can just pull that up for them right then and there. I am in charge of making sure seniors receive the senior handbook, which they all received this week, which has great, um, it's a great resource in terms of questions to ask admissions counselors, how to research a college, as well as a timeline of what types of activities can you be doing each month to help yourself be prepared. Um, I also want to help answer questions and guide students, but it's really important that they do some research before coming to see me. I don't know everything about your family situation or what's being decided, so I can't just tell you colleges to apply to. It's important that that's, some, that's research that's done before meeting with me. And I'll always provide updates about the planning process and scholarships. 
These are two forms that, again, the more time you spend on these, the better recommendation letter I'll be able to write for you. Here's my contact information. Definitely feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I've already started talking to students who are applying, I'm already seeing transcript to, um, requests through Naviant, so that's exciting. We're getting on a roll. I will mention um, this presentation tonight is really the purpose about college admissions planning and how to submit applications. But I do tell students, I tell them my new slogan this year is that there is a path for everyone. Um, so if you're working with a student who maybe has a lower GPA or isn't feeling that they're quite competitive for certain colleges, they should still come talk to me because there's different paths to eventually get on the road that you really want to be on. Um, some students will choose to go to a community college, you know, for the first year for a couple of reasons. One, it might be to save money and take some core classes that will easily transfer to another institution. Secondly, they might have a low GPA. If you spend a year at a community college and then apply to transfer to another, to another university, they're going to base a decision on your college GPA, not on your high school GPA. So those are some things to think about. We do have some military representatives coming in throughout the year, the lunches, to talk to students and answer questions. Um, but I've also worked with students that you know, head into the workforce or do a different type of gap year. Um, so if you have a student kind of on a different path, still something to be celebrated and definitely feel free to reach out for assistance. So at this point, I'm going to end the presentation. Always reach out to me. Here's my contact information. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. Thank you.